Hello, this is Dr. David Gorelick for the Psychopharmacology Institute. I am clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland, and a longtime addiction psychiatrist and clinical psychopharmacologist. Alcohol use disorder, which I will refer to as AUD, is one of the most prevalent psychiatric conditions in the United States. An estimated 29 million U.S. residents had AUD in 2023. But of these, only about 2% received pharmacological treatment for their AUD. Clearly, medication is underutilized in the treatment of this chronic, sometimes life-threatening disorder. The Food and Drug Administration has approved three medications for the treatment of AUD, disulfiram, acamprosate, and naltrexone. Disulfiram was first approved in 1951, but is used far less often than acamprosate or naltrexone. Only about 200,000 patients take disulfiram in any year. Disulfiram is unpopular with physicians and patients for two reasons. First, it causes potentially life-threatening side effects when taken together with alcohol. Second, it shows little or no benefit over placebo in randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials. Such controlled clinical trials are considered the gold standard for judging medication efficacy. As a result, disulfiram is rated as a second-line treatment option behind acamprosate and naltrexone in major clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of AUD. This commentary by Dr. Stephen Holt argues that disulfiram does not deserve this bad reputation. When taken with proper supervision in appropriately selected patients, disulfiram should be considered a first-line treatment for AUD. Dr. Holt raises three points to support his argument. Dr. Holt's first point is that disulfiram is acting as a medication-assisted behavioral therapy rather than as a medication that reduces alcohol use by direct pharmacological action on the nervous system. Isulfiram interferes with the metabolism of alcohol, resulting in the buildup of a toxic metabolite. Thus, a patient taking disulfiram who drinks alcohol experiences almost immediate side effects. These side effects are typically uncomfortable, such as headache, nausea, vomiting, and flushing, but are rarely life-threatening. The expectation of these uncomfortable side effects reduces the patient's craving for alcohol and intent to seek alcohol, and strengthens the patient's confidence in their ability to avoid drinking. Dr. Holt's second point is that this behavioral mechanism of action makes double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials an inaccurate measure of disulfiram's efficacy. The patient must know they are taking disulfiram in order for the medication to work. As evidence, Dr. Holt points out that meta-analyses including only randomized open-label clinical trials do find disulfiram more effective than placebo, and sometimes even more effective than acamprosate or naltrexone. Dr. Holt's third point is that clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of AUD downgrade disulfiram to second-line status, partly because physicians and patients view it less favorably than the other available medications. Dr. Holt believes this puts the cart before the horse. He argues that physicians should base their treatment preferences more on the strength of the clinical evidence than on patient preferences. In the case of disulfiram, the evidence should come from randomized open-label controlled clinical trials. Only after this initial evidence-based recommendation should the physician-patient discussion about treatment take into account patient preferences. Dr. Holt acknowledges that some patients are not appropriate for disulfiram treatment. Patients must agree to have a responsible adult ensure that they are taking their disulfiram as prescribed. Disulfiram must be taken daily as a pill to ensure that blood concentrations are consistently high enough to trigger uncomfortable side effects if alcohol is consumed. No long-acting or depot formulation of disulfiram is currently available. Patients at high risk for severe side effects also should not take disulfiram. This includes patients with liver cirrhosis, unstable cardiovascular disease, or clinically significant cognitive impairment. The bottom line is that I believe that Dr. Holt has made a convincing argument for upgrading disulfiram to a first-line treatment for AUD. I would consider disulfiram for patients whose treatment goal is complete abstinence and who meet the eligibility criteria. Thank you for listening to this quick take.